Moving on to the most exciting presentation of the day, uh, Mr. Lance Gunderson with Regen Ag Lab. Um, they are going to be, he's going to be talking about uh, soil testing for biological function and carbon sequestration. So feel free to put any questions in the, in the Q&A box, or if you still have my cell phone number, you can text them to me, and I'm putting them on a live document so that we're able to see the questions as they come in. So without anything else to say, Lance Gunderson, Do I have everybody. Else to say? Thank you, Jessica. And so, by the way, you said this is supposed to be the most exciting talk of the day. Is that why you put me after lunch? Thanks, Jess. What's that? Everyone's awake? I had some of that extra Roja salsa on my tacos, so I had to bring some water up. Everybody else have some of that? Ooh. You question? I'm a stand-up comedian? Yeah. Some of this is going to be funny. I'm a stand-up comedian? Yeah. Some of this is going to be funny. Has everyone got me OK? I get a, just a tiny bit of feedback. I don't know if you want me to move stuff up and down. OK. Just tell the experts they can fix all that. So I uh, want to say thank you to Jessica Prairie Food, of course, for putting this event on, uh, Chef G and the team. I cooked barbecue for this event a couple years ago. Thank you for getting a chef to come in. Uh, that was way too much work and way better food. So um, I'm going to go through a little bit today on some soil testing stuff. Look, I'm up here to talk about educational pieces of this. I could spend 10 hours diving into just one soil test and really trying to dive into it and, and dig down through it. I'm not gonna do that up here today. I'm gonna give everybody kind of a brief overview of some of the things that we do. Uh, we work a lot with uh, the other vendors you see in this room. Um, Heartland Soil Services, you know, uh, polling soil samples. We work very closely with them when they send stuff to us. Obviously, Prairie Food and a lot of the soil testing and things they do around their product development on your farms, testing out, proving out their theory and what they're doing uh, from a, uh, their standpoint. I got to meet Silva's group here, uh, talking with Brett. We were working on some different plans for some of their growers. So these are all things that we, we are part of that system. Um, and I was mentioning this earlier, is that if we do our job well as a laboratory, uh, you very likely won't be talking to me anymore. Our goal is to actually get you, help you transition down a path, and when you know you're on that path, I'm not, this isn't something I'm here to sell you a service, okay? We're trying to help you. A lot of the people that you hear of in the soil health regenerative space whether it's Keith talking about what they do on their farm or whether it's Michael Thompson talking about on his farm, we're there just to help extend that, that service. So with that, we talk a lot about this. Everyone's got a support team. If you think about it, you've got a support staff around you, right? And I know Michael hit on that pretty hard. He said, find people in this room, find your neighbors, find friends, rely on them. The reason I get to stand here today and go to another one tomorrow and another one on Friday is because of these people. Uh, and there's actually a few people missing from this photo. We just took this in August and we hired three more people since August. Uh, so our team is growing, but without these people back at the lab doing what they do, uh, I couldn't be here today. So it's just always remind yourself of who that team is and who you're working with. Um, for those of you, also Rick Haney. Uh, Rick Haney is a, our chief scientific officer at Region Ag Lab, and he is not in this photo. I couldn't get him to drive the 13 hours from Salado, Texas to take a picture and drive home. So he's missing from the photo as well. But uh, we'll pick on Rick. You'll hear more about him here in a little bit. Anytime something's recorded, I pick on Rick uh, as much as I can. So we'll get some of that. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about soil microbiology. Uh, and there's often all these burning questions when it comes to microbes, right? We can't see them, we can't go out and pick them, we can't throw them in a truck, run them across a scale and weigh them. There's a lot of issues with it. So how do we know they're there? How do we keep track of them? Some of the questions we get or I get all the time is biomass, right? We talk about more microbes. That's something that we focus on in agriculture a lot, right? More biomass, whether it's 
more plants, more yield, more fertilizer, more water. It's always more, more, more. Well, with microbes, typically it is more, but we got to look beyond just the more. Diversity. What are they? Who are they? We talk about plant diversity, uh, whether that's cash crop diversity, whether it's cover crop diversity, whether it's diversity in your system as far as stacking enterprises, integrating different livestock. Diversity is important in every healthy functioning ecosystem. So we need to know who they are. Well, just knowing who they are is great, except what do you care unless you know what they do, right? So, I mean, everybody in here can, and can, can stand up and tell me your name. That tells me who you are just from that label. But it doesn't tell me anything about what you do, what's your story, right? And if I'm going to leverage somebody to come, uh, you know, fix something that I broke around my house, I want to find out what your skill sets are. And when we're trying to build the soil system, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We need to know what those skill sets are. Microsites. So what I mean by that is that when we look at an acre of soil, we drive by a field and we see this acre of soil, we think that the microbes are just scattered across that whole thing nice and evenly and you know, really well distributed and that kind of thing. The soil looks a lot like the earth from outer space. How many of you have seen that photo? It was a great photo, I think. I'll give credit to NASA, because who else would be in space? I don't think Elon was flying up there yet. So NASA took a photo of the United States at night. You want to see that photo, satellite image or whatever? And you could see, here's New York City, right? And here's Chicago, Kansas City. And then Nebraska is just black, right? Most of Kansas is black. And then, oh, there's Denver. Those are microsites. So in your soil, if you take a handful of soil, you've got these colonies or these groups where all these microbes are concentrated. And you move a centimeter to the left or to the right or down or towards the surface, that's like going from here to the moon for us. And so the microbes are not equally distributed. We want to know where they are. And we know that they concentrate around plant roots. Why? That's their support system, right? That's where they're getting food. So we can look at those microsites. I mentioned this, processes. Not only what are they doing or what can they do, but what processes are they carrying out? That's the part that really matters to a producer. Because I want microbes who are going to build soil structure. Why? Well, because when it does rain, and it will, right, Michael? When it does rain, we want the soil structure there so we can get the water into the soil. So we care about these processes, and that's just one example. The mechanisms, and that's how they're doing it, and then we have the controls as to when are they doing it. And I'm going to go through some of these different pieces uh, in this talk today, and I am going to, for a lack of a better term, I am going to get down in the weeds a little bit. Um, it's really hard to talk about microbiology and soil science, and I'm not a soil scientist, I'm a microbiologist, but without getting into some of this in, in some detail. So here are the groups of soil microbes that most of us focus on. Now, these are large groups, right? Bacteria, actinomyces, fungi, etc. cetera. Um, most of us focus on bacteria and fungi. If we talk about protozoans and nematodes, it's usually because we're trying to kill them. I mean, that's usually the context that we have a discussion around nematodes and protozoans, right? Uh, most nematodes are beneficial, okay? Most fungi are beneficial, uh, but we're very good at focusing on the ones that cause us problems, right? I don't think a whole lot about all the microbes in, in my body that aren't causing me any problems, but man, when I get sick, you focus on the one that makes you feel bad. And so keep that in mind. The one that gets ignored a lot is algae. Algae are incredibly important in a soil system because they have the ability to photosynthesize like plants. So they are a carbon sink in the soil as well, beyond just plants. Actinomyces, I know I'm kind of jumping around here. Actinomyces are bacteria, but they are filamentous like fungi. 
So they're kind of a cross between bacteria and fungi. They function a lot like fungi, but they are a bacteria. So not that anybody does this anymore. Nobody in here tills anything anymore. I know that, so I'm not gonna pretend. But if you think back 30 years ago when we used to till, everyone loved that smell. We all know that smell, right? Soil's moist and you go out and you till it and it smells great. Kind of a sweet earthy smell. It's really just the smell of genocide. <laughs> you're smelling actinomyces being chopped up and killed. That's what you're smelling. They produce compounds, aromatic compounds, called josmin is the big one. And they release that when you go through and till them up. So everyone says, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. That's kinda, it's kind of the same thing here. Um, but those, those bacteria are incredibly important because that is the class of organism that provides us a lot of our antibiotics. Penicillins, erythromycins, vancomycins, these antibiotics that we use were derived from actinomyces in those classes. Now, why in the world when actinomyces, you think actinomyces was just there making these things for us? No, it's a war zone under there. We just drove a tractor and disc through the front lines and killed all the soldiers. So now your plants are sitting there going, uh-oh, I've got to come up with a way to protect myself, right? Those, so these are all the cascade effects that happen, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the roles of some of these different organisms. But the big thing is how do we measure these things, right? I mentioned you can't go out, you can't just walk out and, and look at them, pick them up. So there's three major techniques. There's three main classes of techniques. One of them is microscopy and culture plating. Culture plating is when you think back to biology class and you took a cotton swab and you put it on, you rubbed it on this little gel stuff called auger, and then you incubated that and it grew stuff, right? And you'd look at it. That's culture plating. There are advantages and disadvantages to all of these things. So one of the advantages to microscopy and culture plating is that you can be very specific if you know what you're looking for. Um, it can be both qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative meaning yes or no. Is it there? Yes or no. Quantitative, of course, meaning I'm going to count them and determine how many. Uh, Michael showed a great slide earlier of looking at microbes moving around in the, in the soil solution, right? That's a microscopy technique, obviously. Some of the disadvantages, though, is that it's very non-inclusive. Uh, most of the organisms in the soil, we can't grow in a laboratory. And we don't even know what they are. So you can look at it through a microscope and you go, well, there's something there, but we have no idea what it is. And I'll give you a little word of encouragement. So 10 years ago, when I started down this journey uh, in this type of soil testing, the general consensus was is that we knew 10% of all the microbes in the soil, all right? We had a long way to go. Well, I can proudly say that after 10 years, we now believe we know less than 1%. We've made phenomenal progress, <laughs> right? The problem is every time we discover something new, we come up with 10 things we don't know what they are. Uh, and so I, I say that as a joke. There has been a lot of progress made. It's just that what we're really learning what we really know is that we don't know. And so uh, that's the problem with trying to measure some of these things. When we say non-inclusive, we're not including everything. So one of the other techniques is molecular technique, PLFA. That's one example. So we run PLFA tests at the lab. Molecular technique means that we're going to look at some kind of molecule that microbes make that other organisms don't make, right? So we can look at it, if I held up a leaf and I said, do you have any idea where this came from? We well, have some idea where it came from. It didn't come from a dog, right? I mean, we know those things, so that's a molecular technique. We're picking out those, those traits. It's, rel it's inclusive, it includes everything. It's relatively cheap and fast, uh, and it is quantitative. So those are all advantages. Disadvantages is that it's not specific because now you're including everything. And I told you we only know 1% or less. So we got 99% that we don't know. And that's included in this. So it's not specific. 
The third one, and this is the big one that's been coming on for 10, 15 years, is genomics, metagenomics. Uh, and I'm not here to, to talk about this today, but you know, we recently just partnered with one of those genomics companies, Biomakers, uh, to start integrating their technology into this because it's a deeper look. It's almost like PLFA on steroids is what I tell people. So you start to get more specific. It is relatively expensive. It's incredibly technical. Now those things, like all new technologies, will get better over time, right? But uh, that's a, it's a great advantage when you're trying to be specific and look at things. And there's some nutrient pathway things that, that we could get into, but we don't have time today. So I'm gonna talk briefly about PLFA and how we use PLFA to measure microbes. All organisms are made up of cells, right? Did anybody take biology at all? And <laughs> I can't hardly remember my biology class from high school, but I do remember that we always started off in biology. All living organisms are made up of cells. Those cells contain a membrane. In that membrane are these molecules called phospholipid fatty acids, it's a mouthful. That's one of the beautiful things about biology. They always give you these giant words. Phospholipid fatty acids, PLFA. What's neat about these is that these are fats. So when we hear about this, we think of saturated fat, unsaturated fat, oil, etc. These membranes are made up of fat. So we are literally measuring the amount of fat in your soil. This is one time it's okay to say, I want a really fat soil. You want fat in, in the soil, that, because that's your indicator of life. Fat is biologically derived. It's not something that is just out there. Organisms produce it. So when we strip these fats out of the soil, we can quantify those, measure those to say, here's how much you have, here's how much you have. It's a representation of living microbial biomass. The nice thing is, is that when a microbe dies, the other microbes look at that fat as a food source, right? So they consume their dead buddies, which, yeah, right? Sounds great. I right? said, so it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world down there, right? It's, it's, it's not. But they're going to eat each other, and that is actually something we can use to our advantage. Because that happens, this is a very good thing to measure because it's influenced strongly by both environment and management. The environment part we can't totally control, right? Because if we could, none of us would have talked about a drought this year. But we can change the environment at the microsite, and the microbes are going to consume these things. Again, the whole theory, the whole push around everything you've heard is what? Energy, carbon, consumption. Prairie food is a carbon source. Other microbes are a carbon source. Plant root exudates are a carbon source. Your residues, all of it is driven by energy, and that's all this game is for microbes. Energy, reproduction. That's it. So when we measure all these, and you don't need to read all this, I'm showing you this is what, when we measure this, we get a fingerprint, essentially. You get all these big molecules that come flying across the screen, and we look at those individual molecules and we categorize those like an operator switchboard. We say this one's fungi, this one's bacteria, this one's actinomyces. You're just dropping all this into this bucket. So you can start to see what's your bacterial biomass, what's your fungal biomass, because we know that bacteria and fungi carry out different functions in the soil. And they also represent different things. They're a reflection of management. So if we're in a really heavily tilled system, we know that fungi aren't going to do very well. And the PLFA test shows this big lopsidedness with bacteria versus fungi. So how do we interpret this? So this is a table that is actually on one of our, one of our reports. Um, but we first rank biomass, and then we rank diversity. Okay. So on the left-hand side over here, we have 500 up to 4,000. This is your, your total biomass in that range. 
Can it be higher than that? Yes, it can be higher than that. Um, and then we have diversity. And this is your functional group diversity. So this is bacteria, fungi, protozoans, et cetera. We're just looking at how many of those different groups are there and all that stuff. Diversity is highlighted because I often get asked the question, well, what should the goal be? High biomass or high diversity or both? And I said, well, both. But when you're getting started, the goal is diversity first. Because diversity gives different function. Okay, has anybody in here ever built a house? Or had a house built? You get the general contractor comes up and, and you know, and could you imagine if a general contractor ever says to you, I'll take care of this, I'll take care of all of it, I'm gonna build it all myself, run. There is no way that person is an expert plumber, expert electrician, expert concrete guy, expert roofer, right? It takes a diverse team with different skill sets to come together to build something that is properly built, well-functioning. The soil's the same way. When we're talking about building the soil, you first need a whole lot of different skill sets. That's what you get from diversity. This microbe's great at mobilizing phosphorus. This microbe's great at creating antibiotics to fight disease. This one's great at pulling the soil particles together. You need all of those things happening, so diversity first, and then biomass, right? There is no standard ranking established. This drives everybody crazy because they said, well, I, here I am in Pratt, Kansas, and I want to know what should my soil be? That's like me asking you, how much money should I have in my bank account? Well, I don't know. More? <laughs> right? More. Yes, more. I agree. Let's all go with more. So there isn't some magical number that you're trying to get to. What you're looking at is where are you now and where are you going? It's a change over time and you want to see things progressing. Now, with that being said, if I'm ranking in the excellent categories on both of these things, like I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing, but I'm not gonna be beat up if my numbers don't keep going up. There's environmental limitations, right? So it's not about where you are, that's why there's no standard ranking established. It's just, we're not comparing you to your neighbor, to your county, to the state, it's just you. And that's how you look at it. It is dependent on soil type and climate. That's the limitation part I was mentioning. You know, there's certain things that we can do, certain things we can't do. So that's all I'm gonna mention about PLFA because I'm gonna talk just briefly. I got like five slides on the Haney test because normally when I'm asked to speak, I'm, I'm speaking on the Haney test. I'm just gonna mention a few things um, and then I'll get into some of the microbial function and how the microbes are using carbon to give you what you want at the end of the day. So this is kind of a schematic of the Haney test. Um, anybody in here, and trust me, I'm not gonna jump off the stage or hurt anybody, but anybody in here doing soil testing of any kind? So quite a few of you. So those standard soil tests were designed mostly to look at pH, organic matter, NPK, right? They're using a lot of different extracts and they pull different things out of the soil and look at all this and tell you, this is what your plant available is, here you go. And I've said this a few times in the last two days, but then here's your goal, you know, here's your crop and here's your goal, here's what you got, here's your gap, and fertilizer's gap insurance. So you're trying to plug a gap. The issue becomes is that soil tests are only looking at a couple of things down here to evaluate how big this gap is. In other words, nitrogen. I heard nitrogen's kind of important. Somebody said that once. When we measure soil, we look at nitrate, right? That's what standard tests do. They measure nitrate and they say, this is how much nitrate you have. And then you say, well, how much does it, how much nitrogen does it take to produce this bushel of corn? Well, depending on which university you ask or which agronomist you ask, you're gonna get a few different answers. 
1.1 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. 1.3, 1.2, 1.5, I've heard. How much nitrogen is in that corn grain when you take it off the field? 0.68 pounds. So if you're putting on 1.2, where'd the other 0.5 go? You know, 40% of it. So the Haney test, sorry, say that again. Oh, I thought somebody had a comment. Sorry. Uh, so the other 40% that we're not getting, but you're paying for, is not in nitrate form in the soil. Where is it? It's ammonium. It's tied up in microbes. It's in the residues. So the Haney test is trying to measure those other buckets and give you credit back for the nitrogen you've already paid for. And on average, it's 20 pounds to the acre reduction. Don't fool yourself. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that if you're putting on 200 units in, run the Haney test, your recommendation zero. Uh, no, that's not. It, it's just how do, we, how do we start stepping down? Because we know that if we can do so, that's how we're going to save on the carbon side of things, right? So the Haney test also evaluates microbial biomass. The way we do that in this case is by how much the soil breathes. So your soil, like all organisms on the planet who don't photosynthesize, not all, majority, we use oxygen, we eat carbon, and we oxidize that carbon and we exhale CO2. The microbes in your soil are doing the same thing. They're decomposing and chewing up the carbon using oxygen, if it's present, and they exhale CO2. The more your soil breathes, the more life is in your soil. Okay, simple as that. A lot of text here. I'm just showing you the information you can get from that one number. Okay? So you got your, your reading from zero to over 200. You got your ranking and then all these implications. So on the very, on the very uh, low end here, we'll say very little potential for microbial activity. If you don't have microbes there, they're not going to be active. Even when it does rain, even when it is conducive, the temperature is right, food's there. If the microbes aren't there, they're not very active. Now, when I say they're not there, there's a lot of them there, right? <laughs> I mean, it's all relative. There's trillions and trillions and trillions of numbers we can't even imagine, but that are there. But relative, we can have a lot more. The carrying capacity for microbes is really high. Now, this is where most people fall, is on the low end of respiration. These are the people that say, I have wheat stubble that's been in my field for three years. I know so many people right now that are trying to develop nutrient or residue digesters, right? We've all seen those products. You know, go spray this on your residue and help break it down. It's not a residue problem, it's a biology problem. Don't have the microbes there to consume it. What prairie food is doing is taking all of that waste, waste material and digesting it into a simple food source. So it's like doing most of the work for the microbes to get them jump started, right? Get them going. It's like, I mean, it's like a shot in the arm saying, here, eat this. Wheat stubble's hard to break down, eat this. Build up your strength and then go after the wheat, you know, then go after the corn because those things are hard to break down. Very few producers are on the other end where we're really high, really high respiration, and they're just completely flip flop management. The people that have really high respiration have a hard time keeping residue on the soil. So, when Keith talking about armoring the soil, keeping the soil armored, that's the struggle when you've got this big fire burning. And if that helps you, I'm an analogy person. So if that helps you, think of this as a fire. You know, the higher that microbial biomass, the higher that fire. And you need more fuel, more carbon to keep up with that fire. As soon as you stop putting that in, the fire starts to burn out, right? And then you have to stoke it and rebuild it. We do this every year on an annual cropping cycle. The plants do that naturally. So with cover crops and these other things you've been hearing about, it's about closing that gap and catalyzing this whole process, starting this process, prairie food jump-starting that process as one of those products. 
But that's what we're talking about is getting these microbes going. So on to carbon. I know we haven't talked about carbon at all like the last two days, right? Is anybody awake? <laughs> at all, it, no? Is everybody getting seconds on tacos? If you do, grab me one. <laughs> carbon. I love the topic of carbon because everybody comes to me and, I, and they call me up and they say, Lance, I want to talk to you about carbon. I said, okay, now, okay, be more specific. All the carbon? <laughs> we gotta, when we talk about carbon, not all carbon is created equal. Okay? When we talk about this in a soil system, most of us know carbon from soil organic matter. We heard it, Rob said it, soil organic matter is 58% carbon, organic carbon. If you've got a high pH soils, your soils also have calcium carbonate in them. That's inorganic carbon. And all these carbon companies want to go out and measure organic carbon on what they call dry combustion, so total organic carbon. Okay, great, neat. Microbes don't care really too much about all of that. The only time they care about it is if they don't have this, which is water extractable carbon. Okay, so when it rains, or you irrigate, or the plants kick carbon out in the roots, all of that carbon is soluble in water. So we can get up, we can, I didn't say we want to, but we can get up and walk down the hallway, around the corner, and there is food. And we grab it, we walk back, we pick it up, we chew on it. Imagine you're a bacteria. You're living in a biofilm. You don't have legs. You don't have a tail. You don't have a mouth. How do you get energy? How do you get carbon into you? It has to be soluble in water. And the microbes take that across that cell membrane and use it. And then the CO2 goes back out the cell membrane and up and out of the soil. Without water-soluble carbon, now you know why it's so difficult for a bacteria to chew up a corn stalk, right? And that's why fungi are so important, because they start that process. So the only time microbes care about soil organic matter is when they don't have this. If the systems lack food, they start to burn down the house. That's what they're going to do. Now, if they have food, they will actually add on to the house and build the house. And as producers, I, there's only three things I've ever heard every producer agree on. The weather sucks. Today, tomorrow, and next week, and it, it's just bad, right? It's never perfect. The commodity price could be better no matter what it is, and I don't want to lose soil organic matter. That seems to be one, I worked with a producer in North Carolina, 42% soil organic matter average across this farm. I said, what's your goal? He said, build organic matter. Really? Yep. How strongly do you feel about that? Very. Okay. I've, I've never met anybody who doesn't. But yet, a lot of our management practices end up leading to the destruction of soil organic matter. And we speed those processes up through fallow. And I don't mean summer fallow, I just mean fallow. Anytime there's not a living root growing in the ground, that's fallow from a carbon's perspective. Tillage, because all we're doing is oxygenating the soil for a brief amount of time. The microbes access a huge amount of that organic matter that they couldn't access before. You couple that with fallow, they don't have any food coming into the system, so now they're really hungry and they're going to eat this, right? And the third thing they need is enzymes. Enzymes are just fancy proteins. Now, what's in protein? Nitrogen. 
So when we put on a lot of nitrogen fertilizer and we till and we do fallow, we just created a perfect storm for microbes to consume huge amounts of stored carbon. And it's not anybody's fault. When I worked on a farm years ago, guess what I did? I drove a disc. That's right. The guy said, go hop in that tractor and go, you know, go pull a disc. And I jumped at the opportunity. It was fun. A lot of fun. I like that sweet smell of death. Yeah. But that's the process. What I've learned over time is that's the process that's happening. So water soluble carbon is the pantry in this house and organic matter is the refrigerator or the, the house. Okay. We can build the house, but we got to stock the pantry. The last thing here is balance, carbon and nitrogen balance. So the goal here is not just to feed microbes and have this big kumbaya and you know, build up all these diversity because you're sitting there going, what in the world am I gonna do with this? The nice thing is, is that like a lot of really great employees, if you take care of them, you're gonna get something out of them. And the microbes are your employees. When you buy an acre of ground to farm, it comes equipped with enough employees that we can't even count them. So use them and pay them, as, Car as Keith talked about, and I've, this has been one of, I probably still my favorite talk, Carbonomics, because it makes so much sense to me. Pay the microbes the currency they want. And they will invest it and you will end up with the capital gain. When you build into that, when this ratio is balanced, now, when I talk about this ratio, what I'm talking about is the food that the organisms are eating. Protein and energy here, nitrogen and carbon. And when it's balanced, the microbes kick nitrogen out as a waste product. Does anybody else know of any other organisms that do that? We do. Cattle do. We know this because we scoop up the back end stuff and put it back on the field all the time, right? Fertilizer. Microbes do this every day, all day, if we feed them right. Now, they don't want to eat nitrate fertilizer. Why? There's no carbon tied to it. So what do they do? They take your nitrogen fertilizer and they tie it up. And they hold it ransom. And then when the plant begs for it, they say, well, give me carbon and I'll give you nitrogen. It's not a very efficient system, though, because 50 or 40 percent of the nitrogen you paid for is going to stay right here in the microbes. Now, if nitrogen was free, nobody would care about that, but it's not. So again, just this one number, I don't want you to read this, is just this one number, this is the type of information you get. So Michael talked about in his grazing operation, take, you know, take 30, 40, 50%, depending on the year and his needs. But the reason he's doing that is to keep the carbon in the system so that cycle keeps happening, so the nutrients get pushed back into the plants. So the grass regrows, and that perpetuates a positive feedback loop. So stepping away from the, the microbial or the actual testing part, talk a little bit about the growth. So microbial growth in soil is driven under these different energy restrictions and they use these terms, abiotic and biotic. It means living and non-living factors, right? Non-living factors, temperature, moisture, soil type. But what's neat about it is that when microbes grow, and I'm going to move through some of this a little quickly because I know we're going to be short on time. I'm a long-winded guy. So some of these things we can control and some of them we can't, right? But when microbes grow, all these different factors, nutrient availability, pH, food availability, temperature, etc., they are influenced by the environment because they can't regulate their own self. So here's a nice big term, poikiliothermic. 
We all know what this means. It just means cold-blooded, except microbes don't have blood. So cold-blooded. And what's neat about this is we talk about temperature being the driver for activity. It's because enzymes and reaction rates double for every 10 degrees rise in temperature. So as your soils warm, these rates speed up. We see that, right? But what happens when that soil's not covered and your soil gets too warm? The proteins unfold and the activity stops. That's what happens when you cook an egg, right? You crack an egg in a pan, you apply heat to it, and then the proteins change their configuration and we just cook that egg. When you cool the egg back down, it does not go back to its original state. So once we've destroyed these proteins, and we see that when you see all those people, uh, you know, Ray Archuleta, we all know his name, I'm sure, stand out there in the field with a thermometer and show you, you know, ground cover, no ground cover. We heard Jimmy Emmons' uh, name earlier today. Jimmy last year took a temperature, I mean, it's a 107 degree air temperature out in Leedy, Oklahoma. I, the only place hotter than here probably. And he goes out and his, where he had cover, his soil temperatures were 82 degrees. And right across the road, they were cooking hamburgers in a glass pan on the soil. I think it was like 146 degrees surface temperature, right? Microbes don't survive that. And then the whole system stops. So therefore microbes exhibit this growth pattern. And I point this out because what we want to do as land managers is we want to try to influence this, this growth pattern. We have a lag phase, an exponential phase, a stationary phase, and a death phase. So the lag phase is when the microbes are just sitting there kind of wondering when the conditions are going to be right. We're going to jump into action. All of a sudden, the conditions get right. Exponential growth phase. When conditions are right, a microbe can replicate every 20 to 30 minutes. So a billion becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and it's only been an hour, okay? Very quick. Then we hit this capacity where they go into this stationary phase, and then once the resources are used up or conditions get cold or too hot, they start to go into the death phase. What these management systems do when we talk about covers, we talk about prairie food, we talk about compost, we talk about diversity, rotation, you're trying to expand the length of time of the stationary phase, lower the depth or the, the dip on the death phase, and not have a whole bunch of microbes sitting in a lag phase all the time. Because when they're in a stationary phase, they're doing work. Ironically, this is what we see in a typical summer annual, and I say with fallow, just meaning no cover crops on either end. This is the growth pattern we see for PLFA. We ran PLFA tests on the same field every week for 52 weeks. This is what, you know, and we see this, and I've got larger data sets, but this is what you see. Kind of funny, it looks like this. You know, we have lag phase, exponential growth phase, stationary phase, death phase. We can extend that out with cover crops and all of those things and keeping the ground covered and trying not to till it up. But the reason we want that is because of the stuff these organisms do. Decomposition of simple carbon compounds. So when you put something on, plants produce complex and simple carbon compounds. Prairie food is taking very complex, if I understand correctly, very complex carbon compounds and digesting them down into more simplistic carbon compound forms. Again, because they're more readily accessible to the organisms. It's easier for them to eat and digest further. We all know about nitrogen fixation. Micro the bacteria can also denitrify. They can be pathogens. They produce antibiotics, and they're also lithotrophs. Lithotrophs means organisms that eat rock. Rocks contain minerals. So all of these different roles, and we want some of these happening in our soil system. Fungi carry out a little different role. Decomposition of complex carbon compounds. These are the ones responsible for carbon storage in your system. Nutrient transport. 
uptake, plant protection, building soil structure, and I know this was hit on, and I did not add this in just because of the context of this year, drought resilience. If you want to see drought resilience, get fungi in your soil system, okay? But this entire economy feeds on each other. This, the, this community feeds back and forth to each other. So here's a schematic kind of how it looks. It took me 12 years to find something even close to this, so I applaud this publication in 2020 because I think it's about the best illustration. And I show this in most. I know, Rob, you've seen this. Anybody you've seen Because this is really neat. So up here we have CO2 photosynthesis taking place at the plant. Step one, complex compounds. Step one, simple compounds. Right? I just talked about the organisms that are responsible for breaking both of those down. Complex compounds, lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose. Think of that as the stuff you see and you can feel and touch. That's the corn stalk, it's the corn leaf. Most of that is cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, etc. Fungi break that down into simple compounds. The plant also directly feeds simple compounds into this factory through plant root exudates. Okay? All of that feeds into this microbial factory, and you'll notice a lot of this carbon dioxide, this is called step three, efflux. Carbon will leave the soil system. If you create a soil system that has a zero carbon emission, I'm not saying net zero, I'm saying zero, you've got a problem. Your soil is sterile. This concrete floor has a zero carbon emission. We don't want sterile soils. So we need this efflux. So how do we build this up? Well, using the economy uh, analogy, increase income, increase carbon income, Photosynthesis, prairie food, high carbon inputs, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the things that drive carbon income. Slow down the spending rate by the workers. Reduce tillage. Stop fallow. Reduce high synthetic nitrogen input. Those things slow down the decomposition rate. Puts it more at that steady state, not this exponential up and down. When that happens, we're going to spend some, and the excess gets shoved down into number four, which is your stable carbon pool. The other nice way of saying that is soil organic matter. That's how you build the house. So it's not about, it's not linear. Uh, so when we talk about carbon, it's not a linear system. We have to have some going back out. It's got to be cyclical. Uh, it takes carbon to store carbon, ironically, okay? So this is an idea of a simple substrate, and I'm going to show this. This is just glucose. So on the left-hand side, we have percent. So at the very start, time zero, we have 100% of the glucose. After four hours, we have almost 40% of the glucose gone. After eight hours, we're down below 40%, so 60% is gone. And actually, at eight hours, all of it's gone, excuse me. All the glucose is gone, and that carbon, part of that carbon is stored in biomass. What's not stored in biomass is lost to CO2. I only show you this because I want to show you the next one. I often get asked the question, well, how long will it take for my residue to decompose, and what am I going to do? So this is a nice graph. I don't know who put this together, but it's a nice little table on a complex carbon structure. This is wheat straw. So they said, oh, it's a multi-slope decomposition curve, analysis by curve splitting techniques, all this stuff, right? No, there's a message here. There's three carbon classes, soluble protein, cellulose, and lignin, okay? So here's soluble protein, here's sign C2, here's cellulose, and then here's line C3, here's lignin, or lignin right here. The soluble protein in that wheat straw is gone in five days. So what are the microbes eating first? Carbon tied to nitrogen. 
which is why microbes tie up nitrogen fertilizer so bad when they're starving for carbon. They need nitrogen way worse than your corn crop does or your wheat crop. Bacteria are three to one C to N ratio. Three carbons, one nitrogen. Your corn crop at maturity is 80 to one. So bacteria are just little bags of fertilizer. They go after this part first. The stuff they leave alone is the lignin. After 80 days, less than half the lignin is be decomposed. The reason why I mention this is when we talk about diversity and systems and different carbon sources, this is why, because the microbes are gonna attack different things first, different organisms have different tools and they're gonna go after all of this stuff differently. So if your goal is then to keep armor on the soil, grass species and at maturity are your best bet. They carry more lignin, they carry more cellulose, they're gonna last longer in the soil. If you need something to break down quickly, now you're looking at legumes and brassicas because they're the, the protein crops, right? Alfalfa, soybeans, etc. the protein crops, because they're gonna break down quicker. We know this, you see, look at a soybean field and a corn field and which one of them breaks down, but you can use those types of things to your advantage in management. So these are the enzymes that they use to do it. And a couple just schematics. So the way an enzyme works is that we take two things, put them together, or we take something and tear it apart. If it's not for these proteins, this is why the microbes rely so heavily on nitrogen. It's not for these proteins, nothing happens in your soil. Decomposition doesn't happen, nutrient cycling doesn't happen, etc. So these are all just different examples. This is just a little illustration. I don't know where it came from. Um, but yeah, substrates bind. So a substrate can be anything. It binds to that enzyme, catalyzes a reaction. Ironically, most enzymes are driven by micronutrients. Zinc, copper, cobalt, molybdenum, that's what activates or helps run a lot of these, these enzymes. So a lot of us focus just on NPK. I know we talked a lot about carbon and nitrogen today, but there's, there's a lot of these other things that play a role. These extracellular enzymes can be, here again, biotic or abiontic, meaning inside the living organism or released. Most of these enzymes are released. So this is why, this is why prairie food has stepped up the game on micronizing carbon, essentially. So over here, we have a microorganism, and over here, we have a substrate. So the microorganism makes these enzymes, puts them out into the soil. Some of the enzymes get absorbed onto the soil surface, no longer used. Some of them get denatured, or in other words, destroyed. The protein loses its function. Some of them get uh, degraded or consumed by other organisms, because again, this is now soluble protein <laughs> floating around in the soil surface in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. So the other organisms look at that and go, oh, I'm gonna eat that. Finally, you get a little bit that reaches the substrate. Now imagine this is a corn leaf, so it's trying to break all this down and pull it all back, and it has to diffuse all the way back to the organism. It's an incredibly inefficient process, but it's the only process they have. If we can take a substrate and digest it and get it down into this range, more enzyme is able to reach that substrate. The substrate is able to then get into the microbes. That's why microbes can consume soluble protein or glucose so much faster than they can consume other things. It just has to do with the substrate availability. These are just some different classes of organisms. So this is what's really important. In this search for energy, in this search for carbon, this is what these organisms are doing. Recycling nutrients. That is their main function. So nutrients available for plant uptake or loss from the system. So we got all these things on this side, proteins, fats, oils, sugars, amino acids, all this stuff. This is the immobilization phase. It goes into organically bound nutrients. That's in the microbes. And when the microbes die, they kick it back out. Nitrate, sulfate, phosphate, etc. 
That really is the process that's taking place. When we add fertilizers, we're circumventing that entire process. We're trying to force feed the plant. So here's a really basic example and then I'll stop. Ammonification. Anybody in here ever heard of urea? Seems to be fairly common. When they put an inhibitor on urea, what part are they trying to stop? The enzyme activity. They're trying to stop the microbe from converting this urea molecule into ammonium using this enzyme called urease. The microbes are not going after urea because of the nitrogen. They're going after urea because of the carbon. It's a simple carbon compound. We try to slow it down because we just put 300 pounds of it on at one time and we don't want all of it to become available at once because then if the pH is high or if the soils get wet, we lose that nitrogen back to the atmosphere. So all we're doing is trying to inhibit that process. But what we want to do is we want the microbes to do this process and then take that nitrogen into a cover crop or tie it to a ca another carbon source if it's available. I know a place you can get some. Another carbon source, it stabilizes that nitrogen and then it's a slow release into the plant, right? That trading process starts to happen. The microbes are gonna trade that nitrogen or phosphorus, et cetera, back to the plant for carbon. Uh, nitrogen fixation, somebody should look up this. I just wanted to put this up here because the whole system's about energy. Why doesn't a soybean fix nitrogen, as Keith so eloquently reminded us all yesterday? They don't. They feed the microbes, the rhizobiums, energy, and a lot of it, to do this process. I mean, this is the process of nitrogen fixation. So you've got the bacterium up here doing its part. You've got the plant down here doing its part. And it's just a transfer of energy. All those arrows, that's all it is. Denitrification is the backwards side of that. So I'm going to stop with this one right here. I said I'd pick on Rick just for a minute. Rick was with me in June, and he threw this out. Everyone likes to end their uh, presentations with some kind of inspirational quote. And I... I'm not really a quote person, but Rick says, did you know that we live on a plant-based planet which is driven by a star? And he's wearing his NASA suit, and we got a photo of him. But think about that just for a second, because that, that's, that's incredibly true. Everything, and this isn't about, you know, it's just everything, driven through photosynthesis, sunlight, water, right? And at the center of it is carbon cycle, so. With that, uh, thank you. I'm going to put my contact information up there. Uh, much like Michael said, um, network, network, network. Reach out to me anytime. Um, I, I've got a large producer network that I know, and so I've reached out to many of the people here, Michael, et cetera. Uh, Bryce Custer was here, Candy Thomas. I've reached out to them and said, hey, I, I, I got somebody asking these questions. Want some help? We try to point you in those directions. So. Appreciate your time. I didn't leave time for questions, but I'll be back over here if anybody has any. So.